Welcome to History of the Second World War, Episode 113, the September Campaign, Part 5, Panzers. This week, a big thank you goes out to Alex, Kurt, and Richard for choosing to support the podcast by becoming members. You can find out more about becoming a member over at historyofthesecondworldwar.com slash members. When people think about the German army during the Second World War, it's very common to think of their armor formations. Mental images of tanks might be floating across your mind right now, and they probably look like Panzer IVs or Tigers or Panthers. All of these would of course be critical pieces of German armor formations during the war, but none of them would play that role during the Polish campaign. In fact, when the invasion of Poland began, over three quarters of the tanks in the German army were Panzer I's, which were armed only with machine guns, or Panzer II's, which at nine tons were about the third the size of a Panzer IV and a sixth the weight of a Tiger I. The early Panzers were not bad tanks, but it's important to shift your mental image of what a tank is during this early part of the war, not just for the Germans, but for every other army as well. Tanks are not the only thing we will be discussing today, and we will instead look at some of the organization of the German military and its available equipment on the eve of the Polish campaign. As we talk about this equipment and how it was planned to be used, it's important to remember that when discussing the design of equipment and vehicles, or kind of the determination of tactics of how they should be used, I really like this quote from Case White, The Invasion of Poland, 1939, by Robert Forsyke. Quote, Given the rapid changes in technology since 1918, all of the major powers struggled to integrate new weapons, while operational-level doctrine would remain in flux until the test of combat could validate the choices made in structuring and training units. End quote. Everybody in 1939 was living on top of a large stack of assumptions made between 1919 and 1939. And even recent combat that had happened in Spain or, or in Mongolia or in China would largely happen too late to drastically change the trajectory of the equipment that was used in Poland in 1939. Most of the military hardware used in the Polish campaign would be designed during or before the mid-1930s. And so, to, so it provides a really good and interesting look, I think, at what happened in the 15 years after the First World War, when every military in Europe was trying to determine what warfare would look like due to the technological evolution that was happening and might happen in the future. Our discussion of the evolution of the equipment and tactics will begin by looking at the evolution of the area of the military that might have experienced the most change, the Air Force, and discuss how the Luftwaffe organized itself for war. During the 1930s, all of the major air forces of Europe made their own choices about how to organize their aviation assets. The British Royal Air Force would decide to split its resources at a high level, with Bomber Command being given Britain's strategic air units, which would theoretically launch offensive operations against the enemy, while Fighter Command was given the task of air defense. By its nature, such bifurcation of concerns tells us something about how British leaders viewed the air war and how it was perhaps two largely disconnected sets of concerns. The French and Polish air forces pursued roughly the same path, with many air units being put under the command of the army and generally assigned to support a specific set of army units, while there was the creation of some standalone fighter and bomber brigades which would pursue their own missions. For example, in Poland, the fighter brigade would largely be focused on providing air defense for Warsaw during the invasion. The Luftwaffe would choose a different path from any of its rivals, and would instead focus on creating large multi-mission Luftflotten, or air groups, and this would happen in February 1939. At that time, four of these Luftflotten would be organized. The goal of each of these air fleets was to be a completely self-contained unit of up to 1,000 aircraft, which would be capable of performing most of the tasks asked of the Luftwaffe, other than what was done by fighters. Now, this would change by the time of the French campaign in 1940, but before the war, there was strong resistance from the commanders of fighter units to be tightly integrated with the air fleets due to concerns that would restrict their freedom of action. Escorting bombing missions and reconnaissance missions were not exactly what they wanted to be doing, and so during the Polish invasion, they would be largely organized outside of the Luftflotten structure, which would be considered a mistake and, and fixed by 1940. 
The air fleets, with its mix of forces and capabilities, had greater flexibility in how aviation resources were used, even without having full control over fighter forces. The higher level of organization provided by the Luftflotte, instead of parceling out air units to army units as the French and Polish would do, also provided the Luftwaffe with the ability to concentrate a greater number of resources on a given task when required. The Luftwaffe would enter the war in September 1939 with probably its most famous two aircraft already in frontline service in large numbers. Unlike the German armor units, where the most well-known models of tanks are largely mid- and late-war models. The Bf 109 would be the premier German fighter aircraft during the campaign, having its roots in a request from the Reich Air Ministry for a single-seat monoplane fighter issued all the way back in March 1933. The Bf-109, which would meet and fulfill that requirement, had its roots in the Bf-108, which was originally designed as a sporting aircraft. In the modern world, this doesn't really exist, but during the 1920s and 1930s, one of the major drivers of aircraft development was the international competition around aircraft top speeds. The fastest airspeed would bounce around between nations and manufacturers during those decades as biplanes gave way to monoplanes and monoplanes were slowly refined. Messerschmitt would learn a lot during the design and development of the BF-108A, which would be used as a trainer for the Luftwaffe after it made its sporting debut. These lessons in the basic design theory would then be transitioned to the BF-109. Even though the new design was widely recognized as a very capable aircraft, some personal issues between Erhard Milch, the Reich Air Minister, and the lead designer of BFW, Willy Messerschmitt, would delay the contract for the BF-109 and would result in the first contract of October 1936 being for a paltry 144 aircraft. A much larger contract, this time for over 1,300 BF-109s, would be signed the next year, with over 2,000 being built before the start of the war. Early models were also used in air combat over Spain during the Spanish Civil War, and they acquitted themselves quite well during that conflict. The Stuka, or Ju-87, with its distinctive shape and sound, would also be present in large numbers for the Luftwaffe in September 1939. The first Stuka prototype would fly in 1936, and it would prove to be a very capable dive bomber, and with a capable pilot, would be able to drop 500 kilo bombs within 30 meters of a target. The Stuka would earn its very fearsome reputation over Poland and every other early war campaign, really. Along with the flashy BF-109 or the legendary Ju-87, there were many other types of Luftwaffe aircraft over Poland that would be given jobs that were far less flashy, but usually no less important. Aircraft like the Henschel HS-126, which I invite everybody to, to give a quick image search for online. The HS-126 was an Army cooperation aircraft that was designed for reconnaissance and artillery spotting. It doesn't look pretty, but it definitely got the job done. Another example would be the Henschel HS-123 ground attack aircraft, a biplane which, while not the most technologically impressive, was simple and reliable. There were also large numbers of HE-111s and, and Dornier 17s. These were medium bombers, which we discussed at length in episode 78. The production of all of these aircraft would be the result of a massive investment made in the German aero industry after 1933, which allowed the Luftwaffe to go from being heavily outnumbered by many of the other air forces in Europe in 1934 to being one of the largest in the world by 1939. To accomplish this expansion, a large percentage of the total money spent on German rearmament would be funneled into projects to expand the Luftwaffe, and not just in projects that resulted in more aircraft being produced, but also the creation of new airfields and upgrading airfields and making training facilities, all the kind of boring things that an Air Force needs. This episode on the topic of tanks, and in many cases they will play a major role in the history of all of the Second World War's major European campaigns. But before we do that, I think it's worth taking a moment to discuss the vast majority of the men who were in the German army in September 1939, infantrymen. After 1937, an effort would be made to turn some infantry divisions into motorized infantry divisions, which drastically increased their mobility both on and off the battlefield. But motorization efforts were expensive, both in terms of real money and also when it came to the amount of German manufacturing capability that it consumed. 
To give some scale to the problem, in 1937, four infantry divisions would begin the process of motorization, and those four divisions needed over 10,000 motor vehicles of various types to reach full motorization, which represented, at the time, somewhere around a third of all of the motor vehicles in the Wehrmacht. Most of that number was made up of rather boring trucks to move the men and equipment around, but there was also a wide range of specialty vehicles, like those used to haul around artillery. Because of the large number of motor vehicles that were required to motorize a single division, most of the German infantry divisions were reliant on their own feet for their mobility, with much of their equipment and artillery still horse-drawn. In fact, there would be 42 of these non-motorized, non-mechanized infantry divisions that would participate in the invasion of Poland out of a total of 54. So that's 42 of these very standard infantry divisions out of 54 total. This seems quite anachronistic to us today, and even at the time, it was still somewhat shocking for some people who joined the German military in the years before the war. One German artilleryman, Siegfried Knopp, would record that when he arrived at artillery training, quote, you mean they still pull the artillery with horses? End quote. And it would not just be the artillery that was pulled with horses, but also all of the other bits of equipment and supplies necessary to keep an infantry division fighting, with half a million horses being one of the items mobilized by the German military in preparation for the war. There were efforts to provide motorized transport to some of the artillery, with vehicles like the semi-tracked SDKFZ-7 being used in the divisional artillery to kind of help move things along. There's pretty big guns at that level. But in most non-motorized infantry divisions, as you got further down on the order of battle, motor transport became more and more scarce. The primary reason for this lack of motorization was simply the speed at which the German military had expanded in the pre-war years, with the entire Wehrmacht moving from not existing at all to having millions of men under arms within a span of about five years. No matter how much money was poured into German rearmament efforts, there were simple problems of scale. There were limits to how much could be built over that period. It also meant that training was challenging just due to how many men needed to cycle through those trainings. Standard basic training was 16 weeks before any specialty training was added on top, but for the most part during the early period, there was a feeling that quantity was really what mattered. It wasn't so much quality. This is one of the reasons that the motorization percentage was so low. It was much easier to train a man and give him a rifle than it was to increase the number of vehicles that could be produced when there were already so many other priorities pulling on that capacity, from aircraft to tanks to submarines and everything in between. Another outcome of this massive expansion, and also due to doctrinal decisions that were made in how available resources should be allocated, at the lowest level, a German infantry unit was not really that much different than a Polish infantry unit. They were both organized roughly the same. They both used bolt-action Mauser 98Ks, or its derivatives, as their primary infantry weapon, and they both were highly dependent on their own legs to take them places. As you move up the order of battle, though, the differences between the two units become more apparent. I discussed this a few episodes ago when discussing Polish artillery, but one of the major benefits that the German infantry divisions had was that a much larger number of divisional and uh, above artillery pieces were present and could support them. The artillery guns were also generally larger, more powerful, and newer, and especially at the divisional level were far more likely to be motorized, which just meant they were available more often. But back to that earlier comment about how resources were allocated— one of the reasons for the infantry being very similar was due to the spending that was done in other areas of the Wehrmacht, in the Luftwaffe, and also in the armor divisions. The path to German armor began during the late 1920s, when the Reichswehr began to research and experiment with a new generation of tanks. The production of tanks was strictly forbidden by the Treaty of Versailles, but there were two ways that the German Reichswehr worked around this limitation— the first was through agreements made with the Soviet Union that allowed the German military units to train and experiment on various technologies within the Soviet Union itself. The Soviets allowed this because they hoped to also learn things from these efforts while also gaining some industrial know-how from the Germans. The second way they got around the problem of limitations was by not calling them tanks, you know, calling them something else. Instead, the first two German tank designs would be called tractors, the Leicht tractor and the Gross tractor. 
This kind of made sense, or at least provided some level of plausible deniability, because much of the tank design during the early 1930s was not actually about armor or, or guns, but instead was around tread and drivetrain design. As the power of engines and the desired speed of the vehicles increased, there were new stresses placed on the drive system of tanks, from the engine, through the suspension, you know, through the drivetrain, and then to the treads. This required new solutions that were not necessarily required during the First World War due to the relatively slow speed of many of the tanks that had been used at that time. The result of these new problems is that within the tank designs of the 1930s, you often see a lot of changes within the areas like suspension and, and track arrangements and drive wheels and, you know, not really as much within items like armor or armament. The early German tanks, these tractors, were also designed primarily for sort of technological test beds and for training. It was difficult to develop training doctrine or theory without having something that units could actually train with and actually experiment with. These early designs also provided German industry with kind of an introduction to the production problems that they would face as they made tanks bigger and as they tried to scale up that production. The second generations of tanks, most importantly the Panzer I, would make its debut in 1935, and this would take the whole concept of the tank in the German army to a new level. The Panzer I was a very light tank that was roughly similar to many other light tanks during this period, with its primary identifying feature being that it was armed not with some kind of cannon, but instead two MG-34 machine guns. The primary driving factor behind this design is that the German military wanted a tank that was very cheap and very quick to produce, once again to just kind of get more opportunities for training and to determine how it wanted tank uh, designs to evolve. There was also a general emphasis on mobility as the most important factor to a tank's success, prioritizing that mobility instead of heavy armor or a big gun. The machine gun armed tank would prove to not be a productive avenue of evolution, as shown when the Panzer I met Soviet tanks during the Spanish World War, but it was cheaper and easier to make them, which was still important you know, as German industry sort of ramped up its production capacity. When the first major revision of the Panzer I was introduced, it had many very obvious changes, like the engine moving from 57 horsepower to 100 horsepower. But then there were also a lot of other changes, you know, including moving the total length, increasing it by about 40 centimeters, and another set of running wheels being added to support the treads. Again, here at the beginning, you're already seeing kind of this uh, attempts to improve the handling and performance of the vehicle itself, not necessarily worrying about it being a tank on the battlefield. The next major German tank would be the Panzer II, which was larger than the Panzer I in every way, including adding a third crew member and a two centimeter cannon to replace the machine guns as the main armament. This made the Panzer II capable of engaging other tanks more effectively, with the Panzer I very restricted in when its machine guns could be used against other tanks. They had to be very lightly armored. But even with the presence of the cannon, the light armor of the Panzer II made it very vulnerable to any kind of combat with other vehicles, and also to many anti-tank weapons at the time. But it could, once again, be built very quickly, which was seen as a major benefit. But no matter how many of them could be built, the vulnerabilities and the known progress that the French specifically were making on larger tanks meant that there was a general feeling within sort of the German high command that they had to introduce a larger tank very soon so that they could start building it in large numbers. It was worth noting, before we talk about that tank, that the primary armored vehicle in the German armored divisions during the invasion of Poland was the Panzer I and Panzer II. These were mid-1930s light tank designs that even the Germans themselves saw as being outdated and in need of replacement. After the Panzer I and Panzer II tanks began their design and production process, there were efforts that were already starting to create the next generation of German armored vehicles. This would eventually result in the Panzer III and IV, two of the vehicles that would have the largest production runs for the German military during the Second World War. But they were not seen as two tanks that were serving the same role. General Major Oswald Lutz, at the time the Inspector for Motor Transport Troops, believed that the best path forward for tank design was to create two different tanks, 
one that was primarily designed to engage other armored units featuring a high-velocity cannon and armor-piercing ammunition. The second tank would be given a much larger gun and would be primarily designed for infantry support. Basically, it was a way to take an artillery piece and put it on tracks. This concept was very similar to what many other nations were doing at this time and was in no way unique to Germany. Britain, France, and the Soviet Union would have similar ideas about building different tanks to fulfill different roles on the battlefield. In the German case, the Panzer III would be designed to fulfill the anti-armor role, and the Panzer IV would be originally designed for the infantry support role. The Panzer III would mount a 3.7 cm cannon, while the Panzer IV would mount a 7.5 cm howitzer. The Panzer III would go on what I would call a design odyssey that would last through multiple major revisions as they tried to determine how to fix some of the suspension and stability problems that the original design would have. If you look at the designs of the suspension and drive system for each of the first four Panzer III revisions, they all look very different, with different wheel sizes, different number of wheels, different suspension types. It's kind of all over the place. Many of these design issues would eventually be solved, and over 5,700 Panzer III's would be built before the design was retired in 1943. I will throw out a special note that the basic chassis of the Panzer III would be slightly modified and used for the Stug III, which would be the most produced German armored vehicle of the war, which probably deserves, you know, at least some credit to the Panzer III design in some way, especially after all of the flailing that occurred in a search for a stable chassis during those early Panzer III revisions. The Panzer IV, on the other hand, would, from the beginning, be a much more finalized design, And while there would be design revisions made over the course of the war, in the first several revisions, the primary features were not large alterations that you see in the Panzer III, just a bigger engine and bigger guns and more armor. Eventually, there would be over 8,500 Panzer IVs built, which makes it, I believe, the second most produced German armored vehicle of the war. One special note, and one that I will mention a few times in the future, is the importance of the annexation of Czechoslovakia to the overall German war effort and to the armor complements of the German army. When the Germans invaded Czechoslovakia, they would find two very valuable things. The first was the presence of over 200 LTVZ-35 tanks, which would be renamed to the Panzer 35T, and the production facilities to make more, along with the designs and a production line for a new tank that would be named the Panzer 38T. Only a few hundred uh, additional 35Ts would be produced and used by the Wehrmacht, but the 38T would prove to be a very important contributor to the early campaigns of the war, with its generally very good reliability being a critical part of its success. Much like the Panzer III and IV, it would also go on to be the basis for thousands of additional vehicles, like the Martyr III tank destroyer and the Jagdpanzer 38 assault gun. Both of the vehicles would use the 38T chassis as the base for their designs. While the tanks were being designed and produced, how precisely they would be used was something that was also kind of up in the air. The debate about how precisely to organize tank units was a debate that would also happen, you know, in other nations, not just Germany. It basically boiled down to, a nation could produce X number of tanks, and how should those tanks be used for greatest effect? Very few people would deny that the tank was an essential part of any military that planned to launch ground campaigns but there were many debates on the specifics of how they could be used most efficiently. Some, famously in Germany, Heinz Guderian, wanted tank assets to be concentrated into armored divisions and armored corps. The argument to support this point of view revolved around the necessity to concentrate forces into one effort, which would provide the greatest possibility of a breakthrough and then successful offensives. Critics of this concentration of resources would say that, even if the attack of those armored divisions was successful, unless you ensured that there were armored or motorized units in infantry divisions, there would nothing. There would be nothing to assist the armored divisions in their attack. They would punch through the line and then, you know, there would be nothing to help them. This latter group would argue that it would be better to take the available armor assets and spread them around. Not too much, because then they would lose effectiveness, but maybe down to armored brigades so that the power of the armor could be used all along the front. When the German army crossed the border with Poland, it would have a mix of these approaches. There would be several armored divisions, but there would also be some armored units spread out and attached to other groups. 
There were also questions of how the armored divisions would be organized and controlled, because before September 1939, while several nations had theorized and exercised with similar combat formations, nobody had actually used them in combat. This meant that there were mistakes made. The organization of the panzer divisions would not be very efficient. It would prove very difficult to coordinate the large armor groups, and working together with motorized infantry, an essential part of maintaining the mobility of the armored troops, proved to be very challenging. There were other related ideas that would also prove to be problematic, one of which was the liked or light division concept that would evolve in the years before the war. The theory was that there should be a set of German divisions that were as mobile as motorized infantry, but still possessed the hitting power of armored units. The problem that had to be solved to achieve this was the fact that in 1939, the tanks that were present, even though they were faster and had greater range than ever before, were still limited in ways that a big truck wasn't. On a, on a, on a road, the truck was faster and had greater endurance. The solution to this problem was to make a division, the, the light divisions, in which every tank had a large truck that could be used to transport it. This allowed the tanks to use roads to the greatest possible extent, utilizing the speed and endurance of a normal motor vehicle, and then dismount for combat. It was an interesting theory that would prove to be not very effective during the Polish campaign, with the problem being that it was difficult for units to fully utilize the repositioning capabilities allowed by the use of motor transport. At least, you know, use it enough to justify the fact that this one division was taking up so many motor vehicles. So in summary, while the German panzers play an important role in the overall story of the war, the vast majority of the army that invaded Poland in 1939 was still traditional infantry. This infantry was not drastically different than the Polish units that they faced, but they were provided with more firepower, primarily in the form of artillery. The average German soldier was also not better trained than the men that they were facing, but they were much better equipped and trained units within the German army, like the panzer divisions and the motorized infantry divisions, like these more elite divisions were very good. But if the Polish military could tie them down and subject them to some level of attrition, it would take time for the German army to rebuild those more elite units from their relatively untrained conscripts. Also, and this isn't something we discussed this episode, but we did talk about it in detail back in episode 78 to 84, German industry was not prepared for a long war of attrition. It had only stockpiled material for a relatively short campaign, and if the war continued at a high intensity for more than maybe a month, supplies of even basic items like ammunition would begin to be a problem. It was essential that the German campaign for conquest in Poland be a quick affair, and in that way, it would be a huge success. Thank you for listening, and I hope you will join me next episode for our last pre-war episode as we look at the final week of frantic political maneuvering that would occur in the last week of peace in Europe in August.